The following programme contains strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Kia ora. I'm Claire Finlayson, Programme Director of the Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival. The 2019 festival recording that you're about to hear was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. This session, That F Word, featuring Clementine Ford and Lizzie Marvelly, was chaired by Barbara Brooks. Enjoy. Uh, it's very nice to see such a crowd. Um, my name's Barbara Brooks, I'm a historian. And I'm one of the 70s generation of feminists, so it's a great <laughs> pleasure for me to be here with such talented younger feminists and a great pleasure also to read their books. I wanted to kind of kick off today. We'll, we will have time for audience questions near the end, but I'm going to kind of lead the conversation to start with. And I wanted to ask, first of all, we had a second wave feminist movement in the 1970s, and Part of the mantra of that movement was girls can do anything. Mm -hmm. So why now are we still at this stage? What's happened? What didn't happen? What needs to change? <laughs> um, well, I was part of that generation that grew up with Girls Can Do Anything. I was a massive Spice Girls fan as a small child. Um, and I did feel like I could grow up to do anything and, and arguably I, I have. I've been very lucky to have lots of opportunities and so I have kind of grown up to do anything. I've kind of realised I didn't introduce you. I was just thinking that. <laughs> I was like, should we, should I we do so some I'm so sorry. I'm so excited by this opportunity <laughs> that I wanted to launch right in. <laughs> oh, dear. So welcome, Lizzie Marvelly. Thanks, Barbara. And welcome, Clementine. Clementine Ford, and Clementine is a broadcaster and a public speaker and a writer, and Lizzie is a singer, a journalist, and a writer. So welcome today. And the books Thanks. are called The F Word by Lizzie and Fight Like a Girl by Clementine. So back to our question, mm -hmm. girls could do anything, but we're still in the same place. Yeah, I think we're, we're not in the same place that we were before girls yeah. can do anything. You know, I think that that's a, a big shift. Um, but I think maybe it's, it's now moved from girls can do anything to actually trying to, um, you know, tear down the, the structures that, that hold girls back. Because that girls can do anything um, mantra was kind of putting that on the girls individually. You know, it's, yeah. it's your individual... Um, responsibility to get out there and fight the good fight and all that kind of thing. And I think now we've realised actually that there are a lot of structures that, that hold girls back from, from doing what they want to do and from reaching their full potential. And, and not just, you know, uh, I think it's important to, to take that further, not just kind of girls as a, as a hodgepodge group, but particularly girls of colour and LGBT girls and, you know, non-binary. And so there are so many structures now that I think we are looking at, whereas before we were saying, you know, oh, there's no reason why these girls can't do anything. They just need to have confidence. Yeah. Mm. Clementine. Um, thank you. And I just wanted to start by saying thanks so much for having me here. It's great to be here. Sorry about all the palaver <laughs> at the start. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects to the mana whenua of Otopote. I think I said that correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't. I apologise. Um, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I think that one of the problems has been that, you know, yes, the second... I mean, girls have always been able to do everything. And, and in fact, girls and women have carried the weight of the world on their shoulders. Mm. Um, one of the things that infuriates me, particularly now that I'm a mother myself, and of course, like, you never know until you become one, is just how... If you look at the human race as a species who's intent on survival, then you need, whether or not you want to become a parent yourself, you actually need um, reproduction of the species. And it has been largely, overwhelmingly, women who have performed that labour, done all of the labour that's required in the lead-up to birth and after birth and in child-rearing, etc. And yet you still hear people saying things like, oh, well, women invented nothing. You know, women can't <laughs> do anything. Women are weak. The idea that somehow everything that women across all sorts of different backgrounds have had to endure throughout history and people talk about us as being weak is, I think, one of the greatest insults. Um, so when people say things like, oh, well, girls can do anything, but it's just that we don't try hard enough, it's obviously like a... It's, it's a very convenient way to ignore the multitude of structural barriers mm. that 
um, that oppress all of us and, and certainly oppress lots of us in, in ever deeper ways, depending on where those structural barriers are coming from. And also the problem with the 1970s and in, in the minds of people now who think, well, that all of that's been done. You know, I have young people write to me all the time, young men especially, who just hate feminism and they always sort of like pull this trick where they try to pretend that they are interested in women's rights, they're invested in women's rights, but it's all been sorted out now. And so what you're doing, of course, is advocating for superiority, which is what every opponent to any kind of equality movement has ever said at any point in history. Oh, well, it's all been sorted out and now you're just pushing for more. Um, where they can point to the legislative changes of the 1970s and say, well, you've got all of the rights that you need now. What, what, to name one right that men have that women don't have. <laughs> I mean, the right to control their own reproductive health care is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But I think that people make the mistake of, of thinking that legislation, like legislative change is the same as social change and that the two necessarily always go hand in hand. Whereas social change, and I mean, they, they kind of like move like that really. Sometimes social change is much f further ahead than mm. legislative change and sometimes legislative change is much further ahead than social change. So I think that it's, it's really about like breaking down people's willful opposition to reality, but also... I guess, like, recognising that, yes, girls and women can do anything, but w w we can only move so far if, if the race is set against us in the first place. Mm. You know, Jacinda Ardern can be the greatest politician in the world, and she is. <laughs> um, you know, actually, just, just as a side note, Australia just, um, just conducted a poll on who their most trusted politician was, and Jacinda won. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, it's like when people talk about the meritocracy and they say, oh, well, if it's just that women aren't trying hard enough, it's all about merit. As if somehow, like, just classically, parliaments all over the world in Western societies that are just stacked to the brim with incredibly mediocre middle-aged white men, mm. that this is a matter of merit, you know, because, because men, particularly mediocre middle-aged white men, never have to prove their merit to anyone. They never have to justify anything or who they've made a deal with or who they've gone to boarding school with or who they were friends with at uni, you know? Anyway, that's yeah. my long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so we're interested in structural change, I guess, and one of the things that's changed significantly for generation today is the online world, which mm -hmm. didn't exist in the 1970s, and you both write about that, and it's positives and it's negatives, so mm. would you like to say something about how it can act positively? Absolutely, Lizzie? yeah, I, uh, I can. I mean, I very early on, I created a campaign in 2015 called My Body, My Terms. Um, had no idea that it was going to um, and it did, and that was an example, I think, of, of social media being used mm. for really positive means, um, and then went on to make uh, The Real Sex Talk, which is a web series um, around sexuality education for young people, presented by people like Guy Williams, who kids think is hilarious. Um, you know, I think that social media as a means of distribution for really great messages, and as, as a means of two-way communication, when people are... Um, really seeking meaningful communication from people that they otherwise wouldn't be able to reach. I think that it can be incredibly mm. positive. I think it can also be really, really positive. Um, you know, for example, Clementine and I met on Twitter. Yep. Um, so it actually connects, particularly feminists, uh, right around the world, really. I mean, you would, you would have noticed that. I've yeah. noticed that you just become so connected with this amazing kind of international army of kick-ass women. Um, so in those ways, it can be really positive. Mm. Um, but as we both know, it can also be really, really shit. Yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> it can be. And I, Lizzie and I were having coffee before the session today and we were talking about how great, personally grateful we were that we didn't have social media when we were in school. Because I think that the ways that social media can be used to bully is... Mm. I, I mean, I horrible. see the methods that high schoolers use against each other because they try and use it... Yeah, like the thread, the message thread. Yeah, they like they add you to you a in. thread where they're just, like, shit-talking you for, you know, however many hundreds of messages. And, of course, as adults, we're like, what? what the, yeah, like, you guys this? need to you go know, and like, do something Because a lot of... Most of it's just nonsense. Yeah. But then I think if I were a 14- or 15-year-old girl and I was being picked on at school 
at least when I was a 14, 15 year old girl being picked on at school, I could go home at the end of the day and just, you know, listen to my music, <laughs> on my little tape cassette player and um, shut it all off. Yeah. But now you don't have that option to be able to escape from it. And I think that that's really frightening, um, which is why it's so important to like comprehensively talk to children about empathy and kindness and respect and, you know, how to navigate these yeah. places. Because on the other hand, social media can be such a force for good. And, you know, you look at someone like, um, you know, Greta, who is leading a climate change revolution around the world and she's 16 years old and she's using social media to do that. Um, or, you know, the, the fact that, like, not just women but, you know, other marginalised groups can connect with each other Absolutely. and they can bypass a lot of the traditional gatekeepers that have prevented them from being able to organise together and they can really build incredibly world-changing movements yeah. like the Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter, Matter movement is has been extraordinarily yeah. supported by social media. Um, you know, the, the opposition to the Dakota Pipeline was... A lot of that was organised online. Um, the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when you look at it like that, and you can see that um, the potential that it has to actually create social change. I mean, hell, look, even men's rights organisers can <laughs> connect online these days. But they can't um, actually really organise anything to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, they need a woman for that. Um, um, you mentioned in your book the Canadian Don't Be That Guy campaign. Yeah. Um, so, and that seems to have had some su success. I'd like to know... More about that. Yeah, it was an anti-sexual harassment campaign that Canada... Um, <clears throat> Canada's done quite a lot of good social campaigns around th this sort of issue, and they, they ran a Don't Be That Guy campaign a few years ago, where it was basically a poster campaign, I think, and they, they had social media aspects to it as well, um, where it just depicted, you know, uh, men either sexually harassing women mm. or benignly sexually harassing them or just, like ignoring it when their friends did it. And the message was, don't be that guy. And it, it really did have... I can't remember the statistics off the you top of my 10%, head. You see, 10%, the, the uh, abuse statistics dropped 10%. Yeah, they dropped, yeah. Wow. they dropped significantly. Yeah. And again, Lizzie and I were talking in the car on the way here about those situations where you've kind of dealt with... where we've personally experienced sexual harassment and there's been other men around and they've kind of just looked away, you know, or they've ignored it. And it's that thing of... On the other hand, we always hear, not well, nine, you're you bloody feminazis, you just hate men, this is just about misandry. 99.99999% of men are good men and they would never, ever, ever do anything to hurt a woman. And firstly, that statistics bullshit because, and it's never been tested. Mm. But also, it's just like demonstrably not true. The men who turn away from it might not be doing the harassing themselves and might not be groping a woman. Mm. But the moment that they're like, Oh, it's yeah, a bit not my problem. Not my yeah. problem. And mm. also, because I live in a patriarchy and the patriarchy pits me, a man, against other men, I recognise that it's, there's a threat here for me to speak up against this man so I will absolve myself from having to be involved. And this is what feminism is trying to change. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it still hard to say I am a feminist? You both talk about this, I think, in your yeah, I'm, books. I mean, I I've, I've actually I wrote a chapter about all the... Um, the other labels that people give themselves and the linguistic gymnastics that they perform, like, you know, humanist. It's like, guys, there's a whole movement called humanism that means something completely different. I know. <laughs> completely different, spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, you know, equalist and all of these other things, or I'm not a feminist, but... Blah, 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 blah. Um, and I, I mean, I think that partly it's, it's because feminism as a, as a label has been dragged through the mud, but I don't think that that's accidental. You know, I think feminism has been seen as this profoundly threatening movement to the status quo, to the whole way that our society has been built, the structures that you know, this society relies on to continue functioning in the way that it does and under a patriarchal system. And the threat to that has been so profound to... Um, you know, all kinds of organisations and structures. And even just to, to the way that I think people have kind of seen the world, that I think there's been a very conscious negative campaign against mm. the term feminism. Um, and really what, what we're doing now by, by claiming that word, I won't even say reclaiming it because I get really grumpy that we even have to think about reclaiming it, but by claiming it is just saying that, you know, this idea of equality shouldn't be that radical 
should not mm. be that hard for us to get our heads around. Um, but I think there have been lots of powerful players that have been smearing it through the mud. Yeah, I mean, you know, over the course of my time writing about feminist issues, I've often fielded that question, you know, like, well, should we use a different term for it? And my response is always, you could call them sparkly princess, <laughs> unicorn, candy puffs, <laughs> or something along those lines. And people would be like, oh, I think those sparkly unicorn princess, <laughs> candy puffs are going too far. <laughs> because it's not, as Lizzie said, it, and obviously everyone in this room knows that it's not about the word, it's about what it represents. And I think one of the reasons why people always want I mean, apart from the obvious that women who, you know, the women against feminism phenomenon is because at heart they're deeply afraid that men won't like them. Yeah. Because patriarchy teaches us to aspire to men's good opinion and to also make sure that men can never consider us a threat. Um, and I always try and say not necessarily with much success because it takes some unlearning of those... I used to be like that. It takes some unlearning of those lessons. But I always try and impart to women who believe that now, that men will never, even the nice ones, they will never, ever, ever support you in the way that you come out to support them, like, fiercely, you know, because often they'll actually just turn away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the things that women have always been expected to do is to, is to minimise ourselves, obviously. And so even in the, the fight for our own liberation from oppressive patriarchal structures that have not just, like, held us back in the workplace or or whatever, like, but have, you know, historically and currently continue to do significant harm to our physical selves, our sexual selves, our reproductive selves, our mental health, all of the stuff that we're still expected to be polite about it, you know, mm -hmm. because no one likes an angry woman. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that women be able to re uh, claim, not reclaim, but women be able to claim their anger and their right to be angry mm -hmm. and to not apologise for it. And to not have to, like, worry about whether or not people think that anger is ugly in them. Because maybe sometimes that anger is ugly because the things that we're angry about are ugly. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we're entitled to be angry about them. And we also don't... You know, it's that whole sort of... Um, it's that saying that being pretty is not the rent that women pay for in order to move through the world. You know, I've butchered it, but something along those lines. Um, yeah, and I, I just think that it's... That's a real shock for a lot of women to be able to learn that they can be angry, and it's a lot of it's a real shock for a lot of men to realise that women don't care what they think of them. Mm. I still hear echoes of you know things said in the seventies, you know, smash patriarchy. Well, everything old is new again. Yeah, <laughs> sma smash patriarchy. So how do we go about smashing patriarchy? Obviously, trying to speak to young people is one way. Well, it's interesting because I think it's only been in the last few years that patriarchy is as a word, has been used again. Yeah, I agree. You know? I think before that, it's sort of, you know, when I was kind of coming into my feminist aw awakening at the start of, you know, in the 2000s, <laughs> um, and no one, was, no one was interested in it. It was very like, well, we've, that's been all sorted out. You know, words like patriarchy were considered really naff. And um, I think it's really, like, amazing now that, like, this language has been you know, started to be reused again and, and, uh, and hopefully as well in, in large groups, some of, the, some of the things that I disagree with from 70s philosophy have been left, you know, with leaving them away, you know. Um, I don't... Uh, if I knew personally how to smash patriarchy, then... The world would change. Yeah, we wouldn't be here. If we all knew how to do it, then we would Bam. be... But I do think that but, it really... But, that we should be thinking about it. Isn't that, you know, that's what we're angry about. So, yeah. obviously, that's the big challenge. I mean, well, I guess it's the thing that... I'm sorry to interrupt no, you, Lizzie, but I don't think that patriarchy can be dismantled or destroyed unless you destroy all of the other oppressive structures that exist around it. You know, like, you have to destroy white supremacy mm -hmm. and capitalism and... Um, so... Other things. Yeah, so... <laughs> Transphobia, just, ableism, everything yeah. has... We just have to yeah. completely dismantle the whole system and start again. So how do we do that? <laughs> well, one of the interesting things, I think, is about capitalism, right? So the language of rights is a very individualistic language. Mm -hmm. So do you think we need to develop another language? I think that we... Potentially. Um, but I think that we need to... This is kind of what I was taking from your from your latest book, um, you know, which in which you've written some some parts of it to your son and about mm. your son. And I feel like with with capitalism, with racism, with 
sexism, with all of the, the isms and the oppressions, um, you know, we do need to go back to that fundamental stuff in childhood. And no, no boy is actually born as some oppressive shitbag, you know? Like, they don't come out yeah. of the womb um, with those kinds of views. So if we're actually able to teach our boys to, that it's okay to be gentle and kind and mm. respectful and you know that kind of stuff I think goes some way to starting to dismantle all of these structures and when it comes to capitalism and you know individualistic rights um, I think that there's this kind of interesting tension at the moment and I've maybe noticed it more since Christchurch um, and maybe everyone else has noticed it and I'm only just coming to it so apologies if that's the case but um, you know some just because someone has uh, a right. I feel like we're getting into this 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 um, dichotomy of uh, well, my right. Then you're infringing by by uh, asserting your rights, you're infringing on mine. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a society, we need to actually come to a place where we can kind of collectively um, view the rights of all as being equal and. There's all of the issues around xenophobia and and Islamophobia, um, free speech versus hate speech, and all of these kinds of things. Uh, really, and, and you know, call me Pollyanna, who just wants world peace, but um, it kind of comes back to kindness and compassion and empathy and humanity. Mm. And these are the things that have been, you know, um, weaponized and well, they've been removed. And then, as such, we've become siloed. We're actually, as a community, if we're thinking about the collective health of the community, then I think we'd all be a lot better off. Massive tangent, over to you. No, I agree. You know, and I think that um, that sense of, you know, pr proprietary kind of ownership that um, particularly people with privilege have mm. about the loss of power that they, that they may experience. And, you know, white people do it too. You know, I can, I can observe it in men in terms of women getting, gaining more power, but I'm part of a structure in society that experiences whether or not I actively force it or not, I still benefit from it. And so it's that thing of like, you know, going back to that idea of like, oh, well, 99.9% .9 of men are good men or whatever. You have to ask of people who have privilege, whether it's men or white men or even just able-bodied people, like, at what point does our, is our goodness just passive? You know, at what po or at what point are we being trying to be really active in what that means to be good? And sometimes, in fact, a lot of time, I think that what it means to try to be good, because I don't think you can actually claim I'm good. I think being good is an act of trying every day. Um, and in that act of trying to be good, quite often you have to feel bad. And the feeling bad is a really important part of that process is if you're not feeling bad about the things that you're hearing and you're not feeling bad about your probable complicity in them, then you're not actually really engaging with what is required to change the society mm. that you live in. Because, sorry to sort of sound like a cliche, but change does start with yourself. <laughs> and I think that sometimes that sort of externalising, well, like, I'm a good person, I'm going to put a shield up around me so that everyone knows that I'm good and I never have to be responsible for any of the bad things that I do. Or the, like even just the, the things that, I'm, that my privilege, privilege allows me to ignore actually means that everyone is walking around in that bubble and mm. we're not actually really connecting with anyone or changing anything. And it also means that the people who suffer the most at the hands of all those different oppressions are the ones who consistently have to do the hardest work in the most trying of circumstances and environments. So if you are, if you do consider yourself to be a good person or at least someone who is trying to be good every day, then you need to think about how you can respectfully, and I don't say this as someone who, I don't consider myself to be an expert at this at all. <laughs> you know, it's trying, um, but I think that you have to ask yourself how you can respectfully and consciously take on some of that burden in all of your interactions mm. and be the one who stands up and says something and who doesn't, you know, um, like for, an exa for example, a story I heard recently was, it's a fairly typical kind of representation of something that might happen in, in a, you know, a workplace or a friendship group or whatever, where um, a woman finds herself being spoken to in a, in a way that's, that's inappropriate by a male colleague or a male acquaintance or whatever, and she stands up for herself. And there's another man present and he says nothing. But he comes to her afterwards and says, I thought that was really great how you stood up for yourself like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. That, yeah. that actually yeah. achieves nothing yeah. for him. It, it also requires nothing for him, you know. And I speak to men who say, well, it's really scary for me to speak out against sexism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, but the thing is, I understand that. I know mm. it is. Mm. 
I know it's scary for mm. men to challenge mm. other men. Mm. And sometimes challenging other men does come with the potential risk of physical violence. So we mm. all have to make our own choices about, like, to what extent we're going to place ourselves on the line. But in most situations, you can actually just say, I don't like that joke. Mm. Or you can say something about it. Because men speaking out against sexism is nowhere near as dangerous for them as, as it, is it is for, for women. women. Yeah, yeah. White people speaking out against racism is nowhere near as dangerous for them as it is for people of colour. Mm. Mm. So I think that that's some of the stuff that we have to... Yes, we have to go back to, like, what are we teaching our children and how do we kind of instil values of empathy and kindness and the idea that they can be part of a different world mm. but also recognise that it's not ever too late for any of us to change. Absolutely. We could be 85 years old and there's still something for us to learn. And those of us getting there know that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested in that both... Okay, sorry, can I just announce to whoever's doing sound that I'm about to blow my nose? <laughs> my um, both these books are, in a way, self-revelatory. Mm -hmm. So you both draw on your experiences of growing up mm -hmm. and bit girlhood. And there's quite a lot of disturbing stuff, actually, about being a girl in today's society. So the books... I imagine are directed at a young audience. So why did you choose that genre of writing? I chose it because, uh, mainly through my work with Villainess, actually. So um, if, for the people who don't know about Villainess in the room, Villainess is a, an online uh, media project that I started for young women a few years ago, um, where young women can... They, they're the ones writing the articles and, and reading it. So it's by and for. Um, and I found on Villainess that actually, you know, the, the stories that really resonated with particularly a younger audience were the ones that had personal elements to them. Um, you know, I think a lot of young women like to feel that they're not alone in the things that they might be going through. And certainly that, that came out really strongly in Villainess through feedback. And, you know, so, that, so I was really aware that um, that was quite a good way to actually communicate with, with that particular audience. Um, and I also, you know, I, I love, I was at a school session yesterday, which was awesome. Um, and I just, I love having young people coming up and, and feeling like they can, they can open up to me and we can have a conversation. So, so that was the main reason that I chose it. But also, you know, because I think that a lot of the issues um, that feminism touches, I mean feminism touches everything but it can get quite ap academic every now and then and it can get quite you know you're talking about intersectional this and all of the different you know structures and all that kind of stuff but actually all of these things that we these constructs that we have and the language that we have to talk about these things, uh, they exist because they happen to humans and so actually putting human stories to those academic concepts uh, or the structures that we're fighting against, I think just it helps me for a start to kind of, you know, remember the reality of it, but it also helps to illustrate potentially to people who haven't experienced some of these things, um, actually the impact that, that sexism and racism and all of those, homophobia and all those kinds of things, the impacts that they can have on real human beings. Mm. Mm. Um, I didn't specifically really write my book for a, a young audience. Okay. Um, mm. The people, according to my social media metrics, <laughs> the, the demographic that most follows me is women between the ages of 25 and 34. Right. Um, but I just young wrote... Young to some of us. Uh, well, I, no, I just, wrote, I just wrote the book hoping that it would resonate yeah. with yeah. young girls, but also anyone who'd had an experience. It's not just hard to be a girl today. Like, it's always hard to be a girl. Mm. Mm. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that it, uh, the range of letters that I've received from people has been from anyone as young as 13 to women in their 70s. Mm -hmm. mm. And the, the ones from women in their 70s actually break my heart the most because some of them say things like they've never, f they've never, f un they've never understood that they were allowed to be angry before. You know, and I just think that such a makes me so mad, <laughs> ironically, mm. that mm. anyone could have gone through seven decades of their life and felt like they weren't allowed to express a human emotion. Um, I think that the thing about my book is that it's like really accessibly written in lots of ways. I'm not an academic. I didn't, I've never really been good at academic writing. I'm not very good at researching. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it feels like... Um, 
it's a way for, you know, I've, I've heard people <coughs> describe it as being like, oh, it's really a bit 101. <coughs> and it's kind of like, that's fine, you know. I don't personally think it's 101. Um, but I think it's, it's a way for people who are at a 101 point of understanding feminism to get an entry in and learn a little bit more. And for other people who do know a lot more about it to maybe feel seen in it somehow because it's not just about, it's not really a book that tries to teach anyone anything mm. Mm. i think it's a book that tries to like give voice to an experience mm. that a lot of people and a lot of women have never felt like they're either entitled to share or that anyone would believe them if they did some of those experiences are quite grueling um, body image things bulimia um cutting um and do you think that we get enough public discussion of those issues today or there are good steps we could take about these issues? I think that there there is a lot more discussion now than there mm. has been previously. Um, I, I, You know what, I actually, I'm in a place of trying to figure something out for myself at the moment around cutting particularly. So I made the decision to disclose in the book that I cut myself from when I was age... 11 to 20, I think. Um, and, you know, my reasons for that were that it was a very maladaptive coping mechanism. Um, it was never a, you know, a desire to commit suicide through that or, or even a cry for help. It was always disguised. I mean, I'm lucky I don't have scars. Um, but I, I've heard recently, and I was, I was giving a talk to the Auckland DHB, actually, and then one of the psychologists who got up to speak after me told me that something like three quarters of young people are cutting themselves now. Male and, and female. Uh, I can't remember what the gender yeah, breakdown okay. was of mm. that, but mm. I, would, I would guess that it's probably more female because I think more young women present to mental health services. There's a lot of statistics around that, but that's just an educated guess. Mm. Don't quote me on that. And I wonder, you know, because I, I remember I, I didn't just start cutting myself because I thought it was a good idea one day. No, um, sure. You know, I'm pretty mm. sure that I would have read it in a Dolly magazine or, a, or a, you know, some kind of story. And, and I do, where I'm going with this is I'm kind of, I, I'm trying to figure out how to have a conversation with young people about these kinds of things without also tacitly encouraging it, yeah, you know, and yeah. I, that's the last thing I want to do, do but I also yeah. want young people who are doing those kinds of things to, to know that they're not alone and to know that there is a way to get past it because, I mean, you know, to be frank, cutting kind of becomes like an addiction because there's actually a physiological reaction that happens when you cut yourself, your brain releases endorphins and, you know, pain-reducing neurotransmitters, which mm. then is, becomes a, a, a mechanism that works, Mm. Doesn't it doesn't work in the long term? Um, so yeah, so I, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how to have that conversation. I don't have the answer yeah, I right think now. That's really interesting. Yeah. I never was a cutter, but I was a, I was bulimic and um, anorexic first, and then bulimic, and that's actually honest honestly been something that's kind of like I mean you probably still sometimes feel the urge to cut maybe you don't yeah but no I do I yep. think that when you deal with that kind of when yep. you learn when you learn to kind of so yeah it doesn't really go away when you learn to sort of like engage in these destructive self-hating behaviors it's the idea of, like purging it brings the same sort of yes anyway and, yeah anyone who knows who's been through that mm. which is a lot of people knows mm. those dynamics but I think that one of the problems is that um we do need to have a really concerted and focused uh, oh, uh, sorry, a really concerted focus on men's mental health, you know, and it's one of the things mm -hmm. that feminists hear all the time is that, oh, well, what about men's mental health issues? Uh, you know, as, as a, a person, as a citizen of the world and as someone who surprisingly actually does love a lot of men and thinks about, you know, I've got a son and I think about the fact that the largest killer between, of men between the ages of 18 and 45 is suicide, I don't want to ignore that, you know, mm -hmm. I want to focus on that. But I think that the problem is that people then in that discussion assume that men's me the, the mental health crisis in men is the only mental mm. health crisis that we deal with, you know, or the, or the biggest one, or the one that we need to focus on the most, or the one that if we, like, pay any attention to women's issues or issues outside of anyone other than cisgender men, then somehow we are ignoring this huge crisis. When actually, 
you know, we, we might often hear that men kill themselves at a rate of three times that of women. But women try to kill themselves mm. at a rate of three times that of men. Mm -hmm. They just choose different methods. Yeah, and they're less successful. Mm. And one of the things that I say in Fight Like a Girl is that there are lots of different ways... Like, um, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I'm aware that for some people this conversation might be quite triggering, mm. so um, just go gently. But for, for men, the ultimate act of violence that they might commit is against them, well, it could be against someone else, but let's oh. just say that it's against it's themselves. themselves. Yeah. The ultimate act of self-destruction is to kill themselves. But girls try to kill themselves in really long and sustained ways. And their ultimate goal might not be to die, but their feeling might be that they don't want to be here. Mm. And so they might cope by cutting themselves or by... Starving. Engage by starving themselves or by engaging in cycles of binging and purging, by engaging in really destructive, um, addictive behaviours with drinking or drugs or whatever it might be. And I think that people tend to not pay attention to those things as much because they just see it as being part of the, the inherently dramatic nature of mm -hmm. femininity. Yeah. You know, that, oh, well, that's just what girls do because girls are dram uh, dramatic and they're attention seekers. Like, no one ever says that a man's engaging in destructive behaviours because he's an attention seeker. Mm. But because women aren't... Girls and women aren't actually allowed to seek attention, and maybe they are seeking attention, maybe they're screaming, like, pay attention to me because I feel like I'm dying here. Mm. And they need someone to care for them. Um, but because women aren't allowed to seek attention on their own terms, but they're forced to accept attention from other people and how other people believe that they should receive attention, we kind of don't really have an effective way in society f to be able to really address those issues. So, yes, of course we need to pay attention to men's mental health. Like, I don't think that... Any, no matter what men's rights activists think, I don't think that you could find many feminists who would disagree that they want men to grow up in healthier mm -hmm. environments where their mental health doesn't suffer so drastically at the hands of patriarchal values and where our sons and our husbands and our friends and our brothers aren't, you know, killing themselves. Mm. Mm. But also, like, we want... We just want someone to acknowledge that we're going through pain as well and we need to come up with an effective strategy to be able to deal with that. So do you share Lizzie's concern that the very fact of, you know, how to do it, this thing you're pondering, by talking about something, you might yeah. actually make it an attractive Well, I mean, there's lots of guidelines around reporting on suicide because of that, you know, yeah. the sort of mm. the, yeah. the domino yeah. effect. Yeah. And uh, in a completely separate vein... Um, mm. I, I know someone who's doing a PhD on how mass shootings in America started to become more common when people began reporting on mass shootings. Mm. Mm. Um, so, it's so, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a question that we so need to kind of figure it out. It raises a really important question for journalists, which yes. you both are in one... one <laughs> way or another. One way or another, <laughs> or, you know, one of your many hats. Um, so... For the future of journalism, what do you imagine is important as feminists? What, do you think journalism's in a good place right now? Or? Um, I think that what's vital for journalism going forward is actually having diverse journalists right. telling diverse stories um, and diverse, not even just journalists. Uh, in, in the book, I talk about... I, I did a, a, quite a bit of research around our media and... Uh, one of the very non-academic research activities that I that I undertook was to look at all of the commercial radio stations in New Zealand and um, tally how many female hosts, male hosts. Oh, I did the same know, thing. Yeah, Come and on. when oh. I did it, it was it was as you would probably imagine, just disgusting. Mm. Um, it's because no one wants to listen to women on the radio. Well, and it's nuts. It's like, you know, I would totally listen to a, a three-women panel that was doing a radio show. But that how could amazing. you tell which one was talking? <laughs> <laughs> could I, could I, I'm sorry just, to interrupt yeah. again, but I just have to say quickly, I used to be a media monitor, and um, around the time that I was, you know, sort of also doing this kind of uh, tally, and... People would say, oh, well, the reason that we don't have more than one woman on a show is because people can't tell the difference between women's voices. And I have to say, as someone who had to, like, media monitor panels of three men, three men, and all they were all exactly the same kind of men. I was like, <laughs> who is this? Like, which one's... <laughs> is that John, John or Steve? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which 
which one's the most sexist? <laughs> That'll be John. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good point to bring in some more uh, voices from the audience. So do we have some questions? I'm sure we have people with microphones. I have developed a, a distaste for women of my age um, and younger being called girls. And my friends have become a little um, anti-me because when, when somebody says something about girl, I immediately say, the girls are still at school, darling. She's a woman. <laughs> She's a woman. She's a woman. Um, and I don't know whether there's something wrong with me or... <laughs> but the men seem to take a great delight in if there's a group of you saying, and how are the girls doing today? And I always now say, excuse me, we're women. The girls are still at school. Mm. Well, it's just part of this culture of infantilising us, isn't it, really? You know, and by infantilising us and calling us girls, and that takes some of the power away from us, you know, uh, whereas if we, re if we say, you know, we're women, mm. then we can't be dismissed quite so easily. It's kind of, and I'm going to swear right now. But do it, go on, do your worst. I know that some people don't like this word, but it's kind of like the difference between cunt and pussy, mm -hmm. you know. Everyone's like, cunt's the worst word that you could call anyone. It's so bad. It's the worst word that you could call a woman. I mean, of course, men are fine to use it in each other's company, but it's apparently just the worst word you can say in front of a woman. And whereas pussy, like pussy you'll hear on the, on the radio, don't be such a pussy. And I feel like the difference between that is that to me, cunt actually represents something quite untamable and powerful, powerful and yeah. angry. And I have no problem with saying, like, you're being a cunt because sometimes my cunt's fucking angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a big problem with people accepting the casual use of pussy because pussy's weak mm. and, like, oh, don't be such a pussy. Like, I just feel like it's... It, it's one of those unconscious things that mm. people are people are fine to. Well, language is powerful, right? Yeah. You know, and the, the the words that we use, even though they may seem subconscious at times, uh, we use them for a particular reason because yeah. they've come to be associated with particular things. Yeah. And with girl, I think quite often that can be, you know, weaker, less mm. important, less powerful. And there's also this belief, I think, that somehow because the worst thing, one of the worst things a woman can do is age, that if you like that girl. <laughs> I just did it myself because it's so unconscious, <laughs> that women will be sort of like quite titteringly proud to be called a girl, mm. you know? Oh, yes, well, I'm still a girl. <laughs> like, you know, yes, the girls are going out. I mean, I think that women can say it to, of each other. You mm. know, I talk about my girlfriends and like mm. hanging out with the girls tonight because, I, you know, a lot of my girlfriends are friends that I've had since I was a girl. But, yeah, it's that sort of like it's who's, who's using the words yeah. and what, how does the power shift based on... Who's using it? But Context. the most annoying thing, I think, is when if you say, like, we're women and they insist that they're allowed to call you girls and that kind of comes back to that whole, like, well, how good are you if you refuse to listen to what people mm. are telling you? Mm. Question here and then behind. Kia ora, thank you Kia for ora. your speaking. Um, I find it also interesting when I call men boys, they hate it, you know? <laughs> and my partner one time told me he loved my little breasts and I turned around to him and told him I loved his little penis. <laughs> 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 he hated it. I was like, I like well, we don't, we don't talk about the, and how big my cunt or pussy is, but, you know, we, we're going to comment on my breasts, but for men, we've got to make out that your penis is always big. You know, it's <laughs> like the biggest I've ever had. But um, also about the patriarchal paradigm and how to do it, how, I think it's doing it itself by having leaders like Trump, for example. It's going to implode from the inside. It's put awareness so that actually the structure isn't working anymore. Um, and how I'm doing it personally in my own life is I'm starting a business and I'm offering up like barter, you know, skill for skill. Um, cool. Yeah, just just trying to do it as you said, starting for myself. Yeah. Cheers. That's great. And behind. And then on the other side. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, I'm going to be one of those people who has a comment rather than a question. Apologies. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for acknowledging mental health and the significance of that for women because it's so rare to have that acknowledged publicly and it's so powerful and it's really something that needs to be focused on more. So thank you. All yeah, you. I, can, I just want to add to that as well. I was going to jump in when you were talking about that. A friend of mine, a colleague, is a, actually the head researcher for youth mental health in Australia. Um, and she, we've, we've had some really disturbing discussions about all kinds of things. Um, but she was telling me recently that the, the numbers for male suicide are much higher, particularly, you know, and, and she was talking about it from a youth perspective. But actually the trend, the percentage increase for girls is by far 
outstripping the boys, which is a... We can do anything! Yeah, it's a race that <laughs> no one wants to be winning. But, you know, yeah. it's... I do... I think that it is so vital to talk about mental health for all of us, for whatever gender we are. Um, but I, I do... I do see sometimes this kind of discussion of, oh, well, you know, you're raising women's mental health, and what about the men? Right. Um, and it's like, well, actually, it's, this is not an either-or conversation. You know, there are... They're, we're all struggling, and we all need to... But I think as well that, you know, like, if... The same men's rights activists who insist that feminism's bullshit because it's not solving men's problems are, are th you know, they, they talk what about What are they doing to <coughs> solve women's problems? <laughs> no, exactly, but they always need women to do it for them. You mm. know, there was a men's rights march held in Sydney last year and a woman organised it. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and then, anyway, they, you know, they insist on... The gravity of men's mental health and men's... Me I mean, it's a, again, like, it's a, perfect, it's a perfect sort of analogy for the way that men's and women's position in the world is viewed, is that men's mental health is so grave and it's so real and it's raw and it's meaningful. But women are... Well, they're just kind of making it up. Or, they're just kind of like, being dramatic. Yeah, the men that, the men that it, you know, talk on the one hand about this, like, terribly grave issue of men's mental health have no problem calling me crazy mm. or, like, mocking me mm -hmm. for speaking out about my issues with anxiety and mental health. Like, like somehow I don't have a right to speak because I'm, I'm mad. And I just think, like, that's just so often the case is that the way that women experience mental health and the, the ways in which we sort of have that slow drip, drip, of, of <clears throat> you know, the death by a thousand cuts that starts when we're in childhood, for, you know, for a lot of us. Um, it's just sort of dismissed. And if we have a problem with it, then that's just us, us overreacting, you know? It's infuriating. Mm -hmm. Kia, ora. Um, Kia ora. Thanks for talking. Um, so I've been thinking a lot lately about, um, like, a growing anti-sexual violence movement, I suppose, and then the relationship that that has with, like, things like prisons and the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and how... Um, rich white men don't go to jail for rape, basically, and, like, what solutions are there? So I was wondering what you think about um, prison expansion compared to decarceration mm. in relation to sexual violence and what kind of other solutions, yeah. This is such an interesting mm. point, and I've been doing quite a lot of thinking in this area. Um, there are so many parts of this that I'll just try and to say this succinctly, but um, well, for one, we know that prison doesn't work, right? So recidivism proves, and there are such drastic recidivism rates that prison is really not working in the, the large, you know, for the, the lion's share of, of um, prisoners um, and for the community as a whole. So, you know, on one hand, there are, there are a certain percentage of the population, a very small one, that needs to be, you know, kept in some form of... Um, you know, protect. They need to. We need to protect society from some certain individuals. Very small, small percentage. But for the rest of them, um, I've been kind of toying with this idea at the moment, doing some research around. Um, you know, truly, um, a different a different form of justice where where actually it is restorative, and mm. you know, there are actually a lot of uh, survivors who. Right, that they, they, they don't engage with the criminal justice system, and for very good reason. You know, I, only I think it's about nine percent of um, sexual assaults are reported in New Zealand, um, and then only three percent of those make it to the prosecution stage, and only three three percent of those result in a conviction. So, you know, you're looking at this drastic, tiny little statistic. Um, but there are a lot of survivors who, actually, really, what they probably want the most, and I, I know this from my own experience, is an apology and an acknowledgement mm. of the harm that has been caused and some kind of reparation and some kind of growth so that this, these kinds of things don't happen again. And our criminal justice system just does not allow for that currently. So I do wonder whether there are uh, other mechanisms that we, sh we should be investigating. Um, and that's, yeah, I, th I think you're right to be asking those questions and, and I hope that we'll come mm. to some, you know some conclusions that can help to move this forward. Yeah, I, um, I feel the same way, and I've been reading a lot of stuff by abolitionists lately, particularly black women abolitionists, and Sisters Inside recently had a conference in Australia, which unfortunately I didn't get to go to, but I was following the Twitter feed, and I've, it's really challenged a lot of my thinking and, and shifting me into being opposed to carceral ideas. You know, I don't think that prison works. I mean... It's not even a matter of thinking it. Like, we know that prison doesn't work. And also that if, you, if we address structural oppression and the root causes of oppression, then 
we can actually change a lot of mm. what leads to prison. And you know, the fastest growing group of or the, the the fastest growing group of incarcerated people in Australia are Aboriginal women. Yeah, same with Māori women. Yeah. Mm. Yep. And they're the like the most oppressed, marginalised, disenfranchised people in both of our countries. Mm. Um, and clearly the least threat to anyone. Um, but the where, I get, where I'm challenged on it is where I do read stories about rapists being, you know, f found not guilty and getting mm -hmm. off, and particularly mm -hmm. the more privilege that they have, the less likely they are to be. I mean, that's what hits me in the emotional sense, that, like, this desire for justice, you know, this desire for some kind of punishment. I wonder whether the question is, is what that justice looks like. You yeah, know, whether it's I mean, punitive or whether it's some kind of because I mean the the, the overall goal right and this is very idealistic is to mm. uh, make to make sure that those offenders don't reoffend that they actually do their you know they go through some yep. some growth so that they can be rehabilitated. I mean, if I saw young footballers who clearly had engaged in a sexual assault, um, actually, obviously, if it it's the place of the person who that, who's been subjected yes. to that assault to decide what they want to happen, I think. Yeah. But if I saw some actual willingness to try and, like, address the cultural mm. sort of... where that was located in the culture that they yeah. operate in and, and try and genuinely change... I don't, I don't want people who have the potential to do good to go to, to prison, you know? And I think that the reason that prisons exist is to provide cheap labour. Mm and to control populations and to punish marginalised, oppressed groups. I don't know what the answer is, but it's. I guess I just want to assure you that it's definitely something that I'm trying to think about yeah. a lot more And maybe lately. also, like, rangatahi courts, you know, those kinds of models may mm. actually be better suited mm. to to these kinds of questions. But, I mean, you've got to balance the rights of the, the, the victim with the, the mm. you know, the, the hope that the, the offender can actually be rehabilitated and that the community will be better off. But really, really important questions to be asked. And I think we need to have more discussion about this as a society. Mm. Well, I... Uh, I think we're at the end of our time. I'd like to thank you both for giving us lots thank to think you, about Barbara. and lots of challenges about how to change our world. And we wish you both the best for the future. Join thank me, you, Barbara, please. as thank well. Thank you. This Dunedin Writers and Readers Festival recording was brought to you with funding from a copyright licensing New Zealand grant and with the support of ORFM. The festival receives help from many corners, but we'd like to give special thanks to our major funders, Creative New Zealand, the Dunedin City Council, the Otago Community Trust and the Lion Foundation. Mm -hmm.